You're looking now inside the War Memorial, Senator Littell and others as they are behind the curtain, Senator Frank Lautenberg there. The ceremony is just about to begin, some of them taking their seats, others of course uh, greeting each other they may not have seen since the holidays. We are going to be going to the War Memorial for the swearing-in at noon, and of course the ceremony will take anywhere from 40 to 45 minutes. There you have Dan Todd, the brother of Christy Whitman, uh, right by, of course, the New Jersey Symphony Orchestra as they're warming up to perform. We are looking at one historical aspect of this in particular at this moment, and that is, of course, that Christy Whitman is the first woman who will be holding this post. Joining us is Howard Green of the New Jersey Historical Commission. Howard, we've talked with the governor-elect about this, and she recognizes the importance. Obviously, she says she wants to be remembered in the long run more for what she does during her four years as governor than the fact that she was the first governor. But nonetheless, it is historic. Absolutely. Um, the, the, the remarks you just described, as well as uh, remarks that uh, Republican Party Chairman Littell made uh, in the interview with Larry Stupnagel, suggest to me the following. Um, if you look at the debates about whether to give women the right to vote or why they should have the right to vote, you can see a sort of analogy today. The argument was, went in two directions. Some people argued women should be given the right to vote because they were different and would put a different stamp on things and what would change American politics. And other people argued that they should be given the right to vote because they were not different. They were people like anybody else. And I hear threads of both. In, uh, in what the uh, Whitman administration-to-be is saying. She has suggested on a couple occasions, I'm going to be a different administrator. And then on another occasion, she's saying, I want to be remembered as a good governor, not as the first woman governor. We just saw a shot of Lana Hooks there, who will also be sworn in today um, as the Secretary of State, another woman right. who will take the oath of office, along with Deborah Poritz, uh, New Jersey's first woman attorney general, will also take the oath of office today. Right. You know, you and I have been talking uh, also about the, the beginning, the foundation of the women's movement in New Jersey it really goes back to women's clubs uh, in the 1800s and, and, and before that. Uh, and, and I did some reading and found out that uh, President Grover Cleveland, after he left the presidency, just after the turn of the century and was residing in Princeton, wrote mm -hmm. for Ladies Home Journal that women did best staying at home, that that's really where they belonged. And, and wouldn't he be surprised today to see that New Jersey's first governor in 1994, uh, first woman governor, is being inaugurated? The well, his jaws in Philadelphia, perhaps, uh, <laughs> it, it dropped a bit much. There was a woman named Vale from Essex County, a Republican, one of the first two women to serve in the New Jersey Assembly, who, during her election campaign, said something along these lines, the home is the center of my life, it is not the circumference of my life. And that's a very good line we can remember. As, as Christy Whitman looks ahead to her governorship, you, you have mentioned that there are three ways of governing uh, in mm -hmm. this state that, that a governor might look forward to. Uh, right. Certainly governing by consensus being one of them. The way I put it, you can take the case to the people. I'm not a political scientist. The political scientists who are listening, if there are any, may shudder at this. But you can take the case to the we people. You're seeing former Governor Thomas Kane, who's just taken his seat. Who, who, ex Florida. who excelled at that. Jim Florio, Jim Florio you can, was there. And of course, all the way at the end. We don't mean to interrupt. No problem. Go ahead. You can govern through the party. Uh, or you can govern using the administrative CEO executive function uh, kind of approach. And it seems to me, if you look at history, it doesn't matter how the office was organized, governors had those three approaches available to them, and a successful governor succeeded in it. In t if you succeeded in, one, in two of those realms, you generally had a successful term, and if you didn't, um, well, you, you did. Well, the governor there, Jim Florio, still the governor of the state, shaking hands with uh, Chuck Hightayan, the assembly speaker, Donald D. Francesco, the Senate president, and Congressman William Hughes there, uh, just moving out of our sight. Jim? When uh, Indira Gandhi was asked when she became uh, the woman prime minister of India, um, she said that uh, politics doesn't respect gender, it respects power. Um, and that's why you see how the power is exercised over the course of the next uh, uh, year or two. Uh, and uh, that's where the debate will fall, I think, away from the novelty, if you will, of the first woman governor. It'll fall more along the lines of what 
I think Indira Gandhi talks about politics and power. I always recall uh, former Representative Millicent Fenwick's statement, who was my first boss in politics, a wonderful, wonderful woman, who used to say, uh, we're all in this together. Uh, and I think that is the kind of approach that you see Christy Whitman taking to this, her outreach, her listening. We're all in this together, and I'm sure Millicent would be delighted if she were with us today well, to participate were, in this inauguration. There are some who say that, that will Christy Whitman be tough enough for the job, uh, fairly or unfairly so. Uh, unfairly. That, that remark made <laughs> about a woman uh, for the job she is about to tackle. You say unfairly, yes. Roger. No doubt in my mind. Christy Whitman is one tough character, and, 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 and she will governed by consensus, in my view, a consensus with the people of the state. That's not to suggest she's going to moderate or compromise her principle. Uh, the fact of the matter is she's going to be tough when it comes to principle. So, you know, so we just have about 30 yeah. seconds or so, maybe a minute at most. Uh, we're looking at Jim Florio now. This is his last couple of minutes uh, as governor, basically. Quick Sitting thoughts next to the chief right. justice. Quick thoughts from each of you. We only have a few seconds uh, about Jim Florio. Well, he leaves. I think that, uh, you know, this is an individual, a blue-collar background, who tried to really right what he felt were wrongs uh, and felt he had to do it under timetable and pressure and then uh, uh, did something that as many of the newspapers around the state in the last week have editorialized about, said brave, uh, but paid the consequence. Uh, Jim Florio was a, a person that believed that government could solve the problems of, of all the problems, and in fact, uh, it can't. Christy Whitman will try to reach out, as I say, and have the people help solve some of the problems themselves and participate in the process. Well, the power will now be passed on to governor-elect, soon to be called governor of the great state of New Jersey, Christine Todd Whitman, New Jersey's 50th governor, New Jersey's first woman governor. Larry Stupnagel is standing by with our coverage inside the War Memorial Building, where the inauguration is about to get underway in the formal sense. Larry? Well, Kent, uh, in just a few moments now, we will be uh, starting the inauguration of New Jersey's 50th, gover 50th governor and, of course, our first uh, female governor. We are live here at the War Memorial, where the crowd is uh, considerably fuller than when we first went live just uh, an hour ago. Uh, the place is, uh, it would be stand, it's almost standing room only. The first floor, if we go down and take a look down there, you can hear the New Jersey Symphony Orchestra. Of course, have been playing some very uh, stirring music backstage. Uh, we have the gospel choir. We have members of the uh, legislature behind us. So we have members of the incoming uh, governor's cabinet. Of course, uh, former governors, uh, soon to be former governor Jim Florio, former governor Tom Kane, and uh, you can see Judith Shaw there. The uh, incoming chief of staff for Christy Whitman. She's uh, making sure everybody is in their place as we're waiting for the curtain to come up here at the War Memorial. Downstairs, we have a absolutely packed house. I don't see one empty seat. And this is a uh, largely Republican crowd that we have here. It, uh, of course, there are some uh, Democrats, uh, notably some uh, former members of the legislature. But uh, a lot of people here, a lot of people who were here uh, supporting Christy Whitman throughout this campaign, and there are also a lot of people here who are waiting to hear what she's going to have to say in her inaugural address. Now, we have all had a chance to take a look at that inaugural address, and Wally, and here's Christy Whitman. She's coming in right now. She's entering backstage along with her family, and I think probably once she is in place, uh, this, this program this historic moment, the swearing in of New Jersey's first woman governor and its 50th chief executive. We'll start. We can see her leaning over and talking to some of the people behind her, although I can't make out who they are with the shot that we have. But she looks uh, very relaxed. And it looks like she's, uh, well, <laughs> we couldn't really see there. Somebody stepped in front of our camera shot. But I think the, well, that was Judith Shaw, I'm told, her chief of staff, who uh, has been busy rounding everybody up, trying to make sure that this program gets on as close to on time as it possibly can. Of course, the weather has not been what you would call cooperative. Earlier when I was talking to the state GOP chair, Virginia Littell, who had to come down from Sussex County, she uh, told of a seven-hour ride that she had to take uh, last night with her uh, and her husband, Bob Littell, who's the state senator, who's also the chairman of the Senate Appropriations Committee. They, of course, wanted to be here on time. They didn't want to have anything slow them up, but it took them seven hours last night in those horrible, horrible conditions to get here. A lot of people have really braved some tough weathers, cold temperatures, ice, to make it here for this inaugural event today. 
but uh, doesn't look like anything's really going to show, uh, slow them down. There she is again, talking to her husband, John Whitman, who was with her throughout the uh, rough and tumble campaign that she had with Jim Flory. She's waving to somebody there again. There's her uh, brother, Dan Todd, who was also uh, her sidekick uh, throughout the campaign. He was also a source of controversy right after the campaign in the uh, Rollins affair, the, that affair that has uh, since seen all uh, both civil and uh, criminal charges uh, of the investigation drop. There's Jim Florio, uh, still the governor until Governor Whitman is sworn in. He looks very relaxed, and sitting next to him is his wife, Lucinda, and sitting next to them, the Chief Justice, Robert Wilentz, who will, of course, uh, swear in. Tom Kane there, uh, looking down the row at the... Uh, Governor Byrne is also there. Um, and Cahill, I think, is on the far side. Cahill, of course, was uh, present at Governor Jim Florio's final state of the state message. Uh, which was delivered exactly one week ago today. The curtain is rising now on a new era of government in Trenton, and we will go down on stage for the swearing in of New Jersey's 50th governor. Beginning this program today will be the Senate President, Donald D. Francesco. Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everyone here to the inaugural ceremonies for the Honorable Christine Todd Whitman as Governor of the State of New Jersey. We're pleased to have with us today the New Jersey Symphony Orchestra, Brass and Percussion Ensemble, conducted by Charles Baker. Will you please rise? Please rise for the singing of the national anthem by Tia Hunter from Hoboken and remain standing for the invocation. Thank you, Tia. The joint session of the legislature will please come to order. Monsignor Richard Beale of Bernardsville will offer the invocation.
Let us pray. Just as Moses gathered together a diverse people to seek your protection in ancient times, so we come before you this day, Lord, our God. It is you who author liberty. It is you who author prosperity. May our words this afternoon express so much more than hollow formality. May each one of us be truly open to your direction so that we might be your instruments to the citizens of New Jersey, people young and old, some richer, some poorer, with differing needs and differing visions, people who look to us for wise, responsible, courageous leadership. Lord, enlighten and strengthen with your Holy Spirit, your servant and daughter, Christy, our governor. Help her achieve a clear, unified, piercing vision for the common good, a vision that embraces all you ask of us, justice, selflessness, and awesome respect for your gift of human life, born and unborn, compassion, honesty. May her vision reflect with practicality the insight of Isaiah, your prophet. We are the clay, you are the potter. We are all the work of your hands. You, Lord, know the pitfalls that are part of the terrain of our late 20th century, and you know the malaise covering more and more of this land of the free. May Governor Whitman, her administration, and all governmental officials allow you to lead them along a road that is straight and narrow. Give them insight into their relationship with you, a relationship which the words of Christ Jesus crystallize. You could do nothing were it not given you from above. Help them to choose freely what is right and not simply what is politically correct. Help them to serve the people of New Jersey, even when that involves decisions that are not politically expedient. Lord, renew and guide them when they feel fatigued, unsure, confused, beleaguered. May they know in the very depths of their being that the tensions and fears facing all of us can be reversed if we first act on the words of your prophet Micah. The Lord requires of you only to do the right and to love goodness and to walk humbly with your God. Lord, empower us to do this for your glory and for our own well-being through your only Son and in your Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Thank you, Monsignor Beale. Please be seated. Would the Honorable Daniel J. Dalton, Secretary of the State of New Jersey, please come forward and read the certificate of election of the Honorable Christine Todd Whitman. This is to certify that a general election held in said state on the second day of November, 1993, you were duly chosen and elected by the people of said state to serve a term of four years as governor of the state of New Jersey. In testimony whereof, I have thereto set my hand and caused my seal to be hereunto affixed at Trenton on the 30th day of November, 1993. Thank you, Senator Dalton. The oath of office will now be administered to the Honorable Christine Todd Whitman by Chief Justice Robert N. Willens. The oath will be followed by the salute of 19 guns. Please. 
please raise your right hand and please repeat after me. I, Christine Todd Whitman. I, Christine Todd Whitman. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of New Jersey. And the Constitution of the State of New Jersey. And that I will faithfully. And that I will faithfully. Impartially. Impartially. And justly. And justly. Perform the duties. Perform the duties. Of the Governor of the State of New Jersey. Of the Governor of the State of New Jersey. According to the best of my ability. According to the best of my ability. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. The Reverend David Miles of Bedminster will offer a prayer. I guess I have the honor of being the first to say it. Congratulations to you, Governor Whitman. This too is part of our celebration. Let us pray. O Lord, as the music of trumpets rings in the air and the salute of the cannons fills the sky, we lift our praise and our prayer to you, almighty God. We give you thanks for the life you have given each of us and for the hope and the promise of this new day. And in this hour, as your servant, Christine Todd Whitman, stands now before us as governor of our state, we offer our prayer for her before you, asking that you would lead her as she leads us. O oh God, we pray that you would remain near to Christie as she serves the people of this state in the days ahead. Lord, give her strength when the days are long and the challenges are many. Give her wisdom when the decisions are difficult and the pressure is great. Give her compassion when she encounters the pain and suffering of people in need. And at the end of the day, O oh Lord, give her the peace that comes from knowing that all our lives are in your hands. 
We also pray this day for Christie's family, for John and Kate and Taylor. Bind the Whitman family close together and near to your heart, O oh God. We pray for all those here who have been called to public service. Give them vision and diligence and support them in the work they do. Support each of us in the state, O oh Lord as we seek to fulfill our own calling, whatever it may be. Help us to live each day serving, loving, and caring for each other as you have served, loved, and cared for us. O oh God, we pray that you would use the work of our hands, that our simple acts of kindness, justice, and mercy, in them your kingdom would come and take shape before our eyes and that in our decisions, choices, and priorities, your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, we lift up to you this day the song of our celebration and ask that you would tune it to the sound of your grace. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Miles. It's now my pleasure to introduce the Youth Inspiration Choir of the New Hope Baptist Church in Newark under the direction of Mr. Jacques Fourche for a musical celebration. Thank you, Mr. Fouché. I now ask Reverend Aileen Gilmore to come forward to offer a prayer. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, we invoke thy divine blessings upon this momentous occasion, celebrating the inauguration of our newly elected governor of our great state of New Jersey, the Honorable Mrs. Christine Todd Whitman. We are indeed grateful for our representative form of government, our democracy. May each branch of our state government, executive, legislative, and judicial, be ever cognizant of its obligations and responsibilities to the entire citizenry of our garden state. Do bless, we pray, Governor Whitman, 
that she may serve with dignity her constituency, with love, honor, humility, mercy, fervor, and justice. Do imbue her, enlighten her, endow her, empower her, and enable her to always be able to comprehend with all people what is the breadth and the length and depth and height of good, effectual, and efficient government. Give her the knowledge, the wisdom, and the understanding to rightly administer the state of affairs to the state and the state of affairs. May she restore to us a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Do grant that this state house may once again become the citadel of hope for all. Do illuminate and inspire us with thy goodness. For these and all other blessings we do humbly ask in thy name and for thy sake. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Gilmore. I now call upon the Honorable Daniel Dalton to deliver the great seal of the state of New Jersey to Governor Christine Todd Whitman. I deliver to you the great seal of the state of New Jersey as a symbol of your authority. I accept this seal as evidence of the public trust and pledge to honor. Congratulations. <laughs> it is my pleasure, Your Excellency, to introduce you to the Honorable Donald D. Francisco, President of the New Jersey Senate. <laughs> Got to make sure to follow the script. <laughs> Members of the Senate and the General Assembly, it's my pleasure to present to you the Governor of the State of New Jersey. Ladies and gentlemen, the Governor of the State of New Jersey. Thank you very much. Mr. Chief Justice, Governor Florio, Mr. Speaker, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is with an eagerness to tackle the challenges ahead that I take the oath of office as New Jersey's 50th Chief Executive and its first woman governor. On behalf of the people of the state of New Jersey, I would like to thank Governor Florio for his years of public service. We have agreed on some issues, disagreed on others, but no one has ever doubted that you cared deeply. Some say... <laughs> Some say it is a proud moment to be sworn into such a high office as governor. For me, however, this is also a humbling moment. No one reaches this position alone. Certainly I didn't, and I want to thank all of you who made it possible. 
I especially want to thank my husband, John, and my two children, Kate and Taylor, for standing by me during a long and tough campaign. Today, today's inauguration marks not a victory of partisanship, but a test of our democracy, of our ability to govern ourselves. As a people, we face a crisis of confidence. Many have lost faith in the ability of government to deliver services efficiently, to lend a helping hand when needed, and to get out of the way when it is not. We worry about the ability of our economy to generate jobs and restore prosperity. We question the ability of our schools to deliver the quality education our children deserve at a price their parents can afford. We question the ability of our criminal justice system to prevent crime and to deliver justice and safety. Americans have lost faith in institutions that are the foundations of our democracy. They question those they have elected to serve them. Wherever I go, whether I'm at a shopping mall, attending a Devils or a Nets game, Taking questions on a call-in show, I hear the same implicit question. After the O's, after the speeches and the parties and festivities, will you remember your promises and will you keep them? As the first statement of my governorship, to every voter in New Jersey, let me answer that question. I have just taken the oath of this office you have entrusted to me. To me, this oath means one thing. I will not hedge. I will not backtrack. I will keep my promises to you, my friends, to the best of my ability. So help me God. But I can't do it alone. I need your help, your wisdom, and your support. If government is to be for the people, it must be of and by the people. For democracy to work, as Abraham Lincoln said in his first inaugural speech, we in government must have a patient confidence in the ultimate justice of the people. Government must trust and listen to the people, or it is not a democracy. That is why I've spent the last four years listening to you. And it is why I will keep listening for as long as I am your governor. I believe in the people of this state. I believe in open government. I believe that the best decisions are based on consensus. And like you, I believe deeply in the fundamental need for change. To those who question whether I'm serious about bucking the special interests who hold so much quiet power in this city, let me be clear. I did not run for governor to conduct business as usual. It is going to be different around here. The only way government can win back your trust is to earn it. Our principal problems are not the product of great economic shifts or other vast unforeseen forces. They are the creation of government of government that puts special interests ahead of the people's interests, of government that refuses to change. You know it, I know it, and this time, together, we're going to fix it. <laughs> New Jersey should lead the nation. In a world driven by ideas and technology, we boast some of the world's leading telecommunications, pharmaceutical, chemical, and other high-tech firms. We have first-class universities, great ports, and a prime location between America's financial and political seats of power. We have great natural resources, from the highlands to the shore. New Jersey should be the, econ the engine of economic growth that leads this nation into the 21st century. It should be a powerful engine of prosperity that gives our children the same opportunity that our parents worked so hard to give us, the chance for a better life. Together, we will unshackle that economic engine from the restraining chains of high taxes. Four months ago, I said I would put $1.4 billion of your tax dollars back in your pocket by cutting taxes over the next three years, with the first cut coming in July. 
The skeptics groaned, but here we are. And I say, why wait until the next fiscal year starts in July? Between now and then, families have car payments and credit card bills that will come due. Senior citizens on fixed income will be struggling to make ends meet. And businesses have payrolls to make. Their plans to create new jobs are sitting on shelves waiting for a stronger economy. Let's not keep economic growth waiting another minute. If President Clinton and his Congress can reach backward into time and raise your taxes retroactively, your governor and your legislature can cut them retroactively. That is why I will be asking my partners in the legislature, Senate President Donald G. Francesco and Assembly Speaker Chuck Hytayan, to enact a 5 percent income tax cut for every family in New Jersey, effective January 1, 1994, 18 days ago. Secondly, I am asking the legislature to eliminate all taxes on those earning less than $7,500, again retroactively to January 1st. <laughs> those who are struggling the hardest need a tax cut the most. Third, I'm asking the legislature to cut the corporate business tax to 9 percent, again effective January 1st of this year. We will be competitive. No more losing our employers or jo to job raids by low-tax states. New Jersey is open for business. <laughs> Crafting a budget that covers not only the cost of these tax cuts, but also makes up more than $1 billion in previous one-shot revenues will not be easy. We must do so without cutting the state services, which so many of us depend. We must do so without driving up the property tax. The shell game of raising one tax to cut another is over. My budget task force and the 350 citizens who served on my transition teams have been poring over every department's budget. My cabinet officials take office with a mandate to find ways to provide the same or better services for less. Hundreds of citizens have been writing in with their ideas on how we can save five cents on every tax dollar that we spend. Let me tell you, once we put our minds to it, it's amazing all the ways you can find to save money. Take just three areas. A vast amount of uncollected bad driver surcharges are owed to the state, yet no attempt has been made to collect them. We're owed unclaimed federal Medicaid funds for health care services provided by poor children, provided to poor children by their schools. And even an inmate from Rollway State Prison wrote in to the RTAX dollar program to point out that more than $160 million in fines owed by criminals have never been collected. Together, these three areas alone offer the potential for closing the budget gap by several hundred millions of dollars. What's more, almost $200 million has been left unspent in each of the last two budgets because programs were overfunded. I am directing my cabinet to try to save at least that much from current year accounts. Budget cuts are just part of the equation. To cut taxes in each of the next three fiscal years will require sustained economic growth. Economic growth doesn't just happen. We have to plan for it, encourage it, and court it. That is why I have directed my Secretary of State to serve as an advocate for business. And it's why the first executive order of my administration, which I will sign in front of you today, creates the New Jersey Economic Master Plan Commission. 
This commission will develop the long-term strategy we need to make New Jersey the economic powerhouse it deserves to be. Make no mistake about it, we are in a battle for jobs with Pennsylvania, the Carolinas, and the Sun Belt every single day. One of the main reasons we've been losing that battle is state government. We must cut through the needless overregulation that drives businesses out of New Jersey and discourages new firms from locating here. We can protect the environment without taking years to process a permit. Our businesses deserve better, and you deserve better. It isn't just a question of money being wasted. It's a question of duplication, inept planning, and inadequate services. We have 68 departments of labor field offices. Yet in some counties, we require unemployed work workers to sign up for unemployment benefits in one office, then drive 10 miles to another office to find out what jobs are available. Look at how the state regulates cemeteries. If you are buried only with members of your own religion, your corpse is regulated by the Attorney General's office. But if you're buried in a non-sectarian cemetery, the Department of Banking has jurisdiction over your remains. <laughs> That's right, banking. We, do we really need two different state agencies to regulate the dead? From cradle to grave, our state government needs reform. We must reinvent government the way American corporations have been reinventing themselves to survive in the 1990s. You elected me as a chief executive officer of a $15 billion service corporation with 60,000 employees, and that's what we're going to provide, service, efficient, cost-effective service. After all, we work for you. And of all the tasks we are entrusted to perform as your government, nothing is more sacred than our responsibility to educate your children. The school system we have today was developed in the 19th century to prepare the children of farmers and new immigrants for an industrial revolution that wanted bo bodies for repetitive factory work. The world has changed, and our education system must change with it. Employers today require a highly educated workforce that knows how to think and how to be creative. The state that can provide the best educated workers is a state that will be the powerhouse of the 21st century. The states that fail will fall behind. We must make New Jersey number one. We, parents, teachers, students, administrators, government leaders, and business executives must work together to reinvent education. We must make it our top priority to teach our children, all our children, to read in kindergarten and first grade and second grade when they're enthusiastic about learning. That way, we will not have to spend tens of millions of dollars in junior high school, high school and college trying to rectify the failures of the past. We are going to inject competition and encourage innovation by developing alternatives like magnet schools and charter schools within our public school systems to give parents a choice of where to send their children. Should Schools should compete for the chance to teach our children. They are our greatest treasure. If we are going to teach democracy in our schools, we should practice democracy in our school systems. In Jersey City, five long years of state control <laughs> have not fixed schools that continue to do far too little. We should give Mayor Brett Schundler the green light to test school vouchers and invite and invite the top school experts in the nation to measure the results. 
We will get politics out of the Department of Education by giving the Education Commissioner an independent five-year term. We will push authority down to the local level because I trust parents who love their children to get involved in school boards and PTAs. The state can give you better schools, but you must be responsible for raising your children. We will develop a strong core curriculum that teaches every student the basics of reading, writing, arithmetic, and respect for our nation's heritage. We will make our schools safe, and we will demand discipline in our classrooms. The last... The last thing children should learn about in school is violence and fear. Personal safety is a sacred right in America, our children, our parents, all of us deserve to live in peace. Yet far too many of us are imprisoned by fear of crime. Some say we should turn our heads, give up, and just accept a violent, crime-ridden society. Some say crime is too tough a problem to solve. My answer to them, we are tougher. We know that a small percentage of hardened criminals commit most of the violent crime. It's time to make every criminal know that he or she will serve 70% of the court sentence for three times For three time violent offenders, those who make a career out of crime, it should be three strikes and you're in for life. We also need to set up boot camps and other alternatives to teach young people who are toying with the criminal life that they want to go straight instead. Everybody deserves a second chance, but not a third. <laughs> criminals are not the victims of society. Society is the victim of criminals. The way to make our streets safe again is to make sure criminals know they will pay surely, and perhaps permanently, for their crimes, and we will. Our blueprint to make New Jersey first is an agenda of economic growth, good schools, and safe streets. An agenda of hope, optimism, and determination. Of government that is for the people because it is of and by the people. The hope, the vision, the strength of our people is our guarantee of success. And what remarkable people make up this state. In the factories of Patterson and the research laboratories of Princeton, in the ethnic neighborhoods of Perth Amboy and the senior citizen villages of Lakewood, in the towns of the Shores and the Pinelands, and in the cities like Camden and Newark, all across our state, I have come to know so many of New Jersey's people. We are one family, one community, one state. There is a phrase in Spanish that means all that. Somos un solo pueblo. When one of us is out of work, homeless, cannot read, is a victim of violent crime, we all suffer. And when we help one another succeed, we all succeed. I remember a young writer who I think must have learned about America as a student in New Jersey. Over six decades ago, he wrote of a sense of overwhelming gratitude and gladness that America was there, that in the heart of the people, the old generosities and devotions fought on, indomitable and undefeated. The best of America, F. Scott Fitzgerald concluded, is the best of the world. And I can tell you that the best of New Jersey is the best of America. In the people, we will place our faith. On trust in the people, we will build our agenda of opportunity and growth. This is our state. It is our time. And this is our future. 
Last week, I met the children from Mrs. Riley's second grade class at the Gables School in Neptune. Each child brought along a letter for me. We should all learn to share and be nice to each other, Claudia Greer wrote. I know that you have a demanding job ahead of you, and I will be there to help you. Claudia is here today, and Claudia, I thank you for offering to help. It will take everyone's help to meet the challenge ahead. It won't always be easy, and we won't always agree, but we must not fear change. In 1776, this state was at the forefront of a revolution. We are there again today. Let's show the world what New Jersey can do. Together, we will make New Jersey first. Thank you very much. I knew it would be January 1st. Uh, <laughs> I just didn't have the year straight. Uh, <laughs> Seriously, Governor, we're all here to help you, and I. We thank you very much. Rabbi Norman Pates will invoke the benediction. Our God and God of our ancestors, look with blessing upon these inaugural proceedings now concluding. Bestow your favor upon our new governor, Christine Todd Whitman, and upon all the other constituted officers of government in this great state. Confirm in their hearts the spirit of wisdom, compassion, and understanding. Help them spread the sheltering tabernacle of your peace over the land so that we may hear and feel and respond to each other's fears and pains, hopes and dreams, and thus together rebuild our society so that all of its citizens can live in genuine harmony and tranquility. Source of blessings, teach us all to realize that your beneficence provides us with the keys to unlock that power for good which is already within every one of us. Let every person, every family, every community renew the effort to strengthen the common weal for the good of all and to the hurt of none. May the divine spark within each of us glow more brightly as we dedicate ourselves to making secure and preserving the social contract that promises liberty and justice to all. Author of liberty, we look to you for truth to guide us, but we also know full well that we are your partners and that your work gets done by our hands. We are your witnesses. We cannot expect others to take up the tasks that are ours to do. Help us, we pray, to go forward, leaders and citizens together, and make New Jersey a shining example of American democracy as it ought to be. 
May this be your will, O God, and therefore ours. Amen. I now have the pleasure of recognizing the Speaker of the General Assembly, the Honorable Chuck Hightower. session now rise and adjourn this meeting do i hear a second second somebody <laughs> you're worried there jack so ordered these proceedings are concluded the senate will reconvene at two o'clock thank you ceremonies for Christine Todd Whitman, New Jersey's 50th government and their first female government. Uh, this is, was as much an inaugural address, I think, today. Uh, it was also a state of the state message in that she clearly came out and outlined what it was she wants to accomplish in the next few days. As a matter of fact, uh, what she sh thinks should have been accomplished going back to January 1st. In her inaugural address, she says she wants to have a 5% tax cut for all New Jerseyans, retroactive to the, for all New Jerseyans, retroactive to January 1st. She also wants to see the corporate income tax roll back to 9% retroactive to January 1st, and she wants to see all taxes for people making under $7,500 eliminated. She also said that the way that some of the monies could be found to do this or collect uh, on some bad driver surcharges, there's some uh, federal Medicaid funds that could be collected, and she's also about to, talking about taking money back from criminals. The governor today also outlined a very, very, very uh, ambitious education agenda. She, uh, most notable here is that she wants to see uh, the voucher system for in Jersey City get a try. Uh, right now down on the stage we have former Governor Brendan Byrne. He's talking to the dean of the Democratic delegation, uh, William Hughes. Uh, Democrats here, of course, are decidedly in the minority in the uh, days to come, the uh, Republicans having a overwhelming majorities in both houses and also uh, with the uh, and also in both houses of the legislature. I'm going to throw it back to Kent Manahan now. Let's go back to the studio. Thank you, Larry. We have more coverage of the inaugural of Christy Whitman as New Jersey's 50th governor when we continue here on NJN. New Jersey's first Republican governor was sworn in 144 years ago. William Newell, a doctor from Manahawkin, served two years in Congress before taking office back home. He formed a friendship with Abraham Lincoln while in Washington, and after governing New Jersey, he became the attending physician at the White House. Newell went on to become the governor of Washington Territory and the commissioner of Indian Affairs. William Newell governed from 1857 to 1860. Thomas Woodrow Wilson, the 34th governor of New Jersey, was born in Virginia, the son of a reverend. He came north to New Jersey to attend Princeton University, and he taught and was president there before becoming governor. After only two years in office, Wilson was elected the 28th president of the United States. He said of his governorship that serving the people of New Jersey had been the greatest privilege of his life. Woodrow Wilson governed from 1911 to 1913. Welcome back to NJN's coverage of Inaugural 94. I'm Kent Matahan along with Steve Highsmith. It is now official. New Jersey has its 50th governor. 
It's first Governor Christine Todd Woodman sworn into office a little after noontime today at the War Memorial Building in Trenton. She has just delivered her inaugural address, 24 pages. Not the longest uh, address probably to be given to New Jerseyans as a new governor takes office, but one uh, perhaps that we could say uh, touched on crime, uh, touched on education, and certainly her promised tax plan, and one in which uh, son and daughter Kate and Taylor were well behaved uh, as compared to uh, <laughs> uh, Andrew Giuliani New York, in New York, <laughs> right, uh, who mugged for the camera throughout the inaugural speech of his father. Yeah, I was struck by a couple of things. Obviously, it's a transition of power and responsibility, but to uh, paraphrase one of her favorite singers, Johnny Cash. He's also in the ring of fire now, and I'm sure that the, uh, the serious criticism analysis and the real work has to begin. And as you could see, uh, with Senator DeFrancesco's Senate President's comment about, I knew I had the date right, January 1st, but I must have had the year wrong about Perhaps the tax cut. Perhaps a line that will be There's quoted a lot the to most. Still work out here. The other thing I found interesting uh, about this is that we talked a little bit earlier about one aspect of this. Jim Florio, in his inaugural four years ago, left out a sentence in his text about, I will keep my promises. One of the strongest lines in her speech was, I will keep my promises. And that could be a big difference, at least in the tone setting out in this campaign. We this, are joined. Uh, as running as governor. Of course, by Roger Bodman and Jean McQueen, Jim McQueenie, our regulars here on NJN, and Howard Green from the New Jersey Historical Commission. And uh, we welcome you back to our coverage of Inaugural 94. You. Roger, you have heard the speeches, as, as we all have, and, and certainly Mrs. Whitman made a pledge today to New Jerseyans in her inaugural address. Absolutely, she did. And, uh, you know, it comes to mind, interestingly, uh, comes to my mind is, is a Democrat president, Harry S. Truman, who is known for plain speaking. This speech was full of plain speaking, in my view, and, and, and it wasn't one of uh, uh, those visionary type speeches that, you know, George Bush used to call it the vision thing, you know. This was a speech where she just got right down to the nuts and bolts of government. Uh, it was almost like a budget speech, or as, as Larry Snoopdakel said, a, a State of the State address. You know, she quoted a lot of interesting lines here, one of which is, uh, after all, we all work for you uh, is, a, I think, a, an interesting statement to make, an important statement to make. But, but as, as Steve just mentioned, uh, I think the most important was, uh, as the first statement of my governorship, uh, uh, I will not hedge, I will not backtrack, I will keep my promises to you. I think we you. have a tape version of that, if we? we could play it back for our audience to listen once again to New Jersey's 50th governor. Wherever I go, whether I'm at a shopping mall, attending a Devils or a Nets game, taking questions on a call-in show, I hear the same implicit question. After the oaths, after the speeches and the parties and festivities, will you remember your promises and will you keep them? As the first statement of my governorship to every voter in New Jersey, let me answer that question. I have just taken the oath of this office you have entrusted to me. To me, this oath means one thing. I will not hedge. I will not backtrack. I will keep my promises to you, my friends, to the best of my ability. So help me God. Definitive words, certainly, Roger, when you talk about that pledge to New Jerseyans and what she plans to accomplish. And very sincere words, too, Kent. The fact of the matter is you could see the way she said it, the way she enunciated those words, I will keep my promises to you. And I think, uh, as, as, as compared to her predecessor, with all due respect, uh, that was a problem in, in the last four years in this state. I don't believe it will be a problem in the next four. Of course, four. she needs the cooperation of the legislature in order to keep that pledge, and, and she did put the onus on the legislature in her speech today. Jim McQueenie, one of the strengths that Christy Whitman had in the campaign by those who step back and look at it is that she had a sense, a good sense, of what many in, in this state want and that when she would go out to events, she would listen to people. Do you find any evidence of that in this? I think actually in this, uh, in this speech she made a direct reference to uh, how, how she wants to listen, but also and a little bit referring to what Roger said about how she's still paying attention to what went wrong before her, if you will, with mistakes in the Florida administration as she perceives them. And one of them is that they want to listen. And uh, this bite, I think, that we have explains that also. Let's, let's go ahead and take a look at that now from the speech today by the governor. Government must trust and listen to the people, or it is not a democracy. That is why I've spent the last four years listening to you, and it is why I will keep listening for as long as I am your governor. 
I think one of the things that's uh, important about this, though, is that you can listen for a while and hear things, uh, but, you know, some of the things that she's heard, she'll hear some things she'll use in cutting the budget, I'm sure, but some of the things you hear when you're out there, a lot of them are really loony because people don't understand government, uh, and that's not meant as a patronizing comment. If you saw some of the call-in shows and some of the recommendations, people were calling in suggesting that dead deer killed on the highways be fed to state prisoners. Um, I saw one, and I think it was uh, on NJN, actually, um, <clears throat> where someone called in and said we're spending too much money on police cars that only end up giving us traffic tickets by radar that end up taking money out of our pockets. It's this sort of syllogistic logic that sort of isn't going to come into play. What happens then when people say, you didn't listen to us with that? I know, I know everyone here wants to chime in, and we're going to get the chance to do that, but I'm being told that uh, I'm going to send it now to Michael Aaron, who is standing by outside the War Memorial Building to continue our coverage of Inauguration 94. Michael? Ken, I'm here with Assemblyman Leonard Lance of Hunterdon County, one of the earlier supporters of Christy Whitman. Is that right? You were one of the first? That, that's right, Michael. I think I may have been the first. I've known Christy my whole life, and I think she'll be a great governor. What did you think of her address today? I thought it demonstrates that business is not going to operate as usual in New Jersey from this point forward and that she really is committed to change, particularly regarding our income tax. Were you surprised that she called for this retroactive tax cut? Yes, I was. I did not know about it ahead of the public, her actual speech. Do you think that she'll have any difficulty getting that retroactive income tax cut and two other tax cuts retroactive to January 1st through your legislature? No, I don't think so, because the legislature is supportive of the new governor. We're all Republicans in the majority now, working with a Republican governor. The first time we've been in that situation for 20 years. You look cold without a top coat. One quick question. And then I'll let you go. What was the feeling inside there? On, were you on the stage or on the ground? I was on the stage. What I was think, the feeling? I think we were excited because now we have the opportunity to lead, and if we don't lead, we will be removed from office. It's time for changes in New Jersey. All right, Assemblyman Leonard Lance, thanks very much. Thank go you, get Michael. your top coat. It's Michael Aaron. Let's go to Larry Stupnagel, who's inside where it's warm. Larry? That's, my, that's right, Mike. It is considerably warmer in here. Joining me now is the Assembly Minority Leader, Joe Doria. Uh, Joe, what did you think of the speech? Well, it was a very brief speech. I think she hit on a number of salient points. I think the uh, thing that caught everybody by surprise was the concept of the 5% retroactive uh, decrease in taxes, which obviously everybody would be supportive of. The, depending upon what the impact upon the, of the final proposal would be. I think Donnie DiFrancesco, the Senate president, uh, got the best laugh of the day when he said he knew it was January 1st, but he thought it was January 1st of another year, next year, So, uh, which he had been pushing, as you uh, realize. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, there was nothing surprising. It was, she basically uh, did what most of us thought that she would do. She talked about uh, the issues that are of importance to the state and of importance to her and her campaign. And now we have to wait to see the uh, final proposals. And until we see the proposals, there's no way to know the impact these proposals will have on the state and on the citizens of the state. Do you have any idea how much these retroactive tax cuts are going to cost? Might they add up to that $288 million that the Florio administration said it found last week, left over from the last fiscal year? It might. Uh, there's no way of knowing until we see the proposals. And as I said, until that happens, I would have to reserve judgment. Uh, I would have to see the impact upon all the proposals on services, state services. Everyone's for more efficient government and uh, more efficient services. So if we can save money through efficiency, obviously we support it. The biggest concern that I would have and the uh, Democrats in the Assembly would have it, is that we don't allow an increase in property taxes. And she restated that commitment today, and I was happy to hear that. that decreases in state taxes will not result in a transfer to the property tax, which we have for a long time felt is the most onerous of taxes and the one that we're most concerned about uh, because of the fact that during the 1980s it increased by over 100 percent. What is going to be the Democratic role now in this new uh, administration with this new legislature? You're, uh, you're really in, a, in, in minorities in both houses. What, what, what role is your job? What, what's your job now for the next few years? I think our jo role will be that of the loyal opposition. Our responsibility will be to question the proposals, to be cooperative and to act on a bipartisan basis when the proposals are things that will benefit the citizens of the state, and at the same time to question proposals that we feel could be harmful to the citizens of the state, such as the cutting back of services that are necessary or increases in things such as property taxes or fees. You know, it's, it's great to cut taxes and everybody supports that. As long as while we're cutting taxes with one hand, we're not increasing fees or 
increasing property taxes with another. That's not to the benefit of the citizens. And the governor-elect, and now the governor, Governor Whitman, said that. And I'm supportive of her statement that if we cut taxes at the state level, we shouldn't be increasing taxes other places. So we're going to be there. We want to work on a bipartisan basis. Things like regulatory reform, we have done on a bipartisan basis. Economic development, we're supportive of that, and we'll work with her on that. And obviously, we support the concept of the executive order that she signed today. So those types of things, I think we will be bipartisan. I think we will work together when we have to, and we will act as the loyal opposition and present alternatives when we feel those alternatives have to be presented for the benefit of the citizens of the state. You're from Hudson County. On the education front, she said it's time for Jersey City to uh, go ahead and try the school voucher uh, program that Mayor Schundler has been uh, pushing for the last year or so. What's your reaction to that? Well, I myself have been supportive of the concept of choice. Uh, the proposal that Mayor Schundler had pre presented and that I've read I am not in agreement with because I think there's a lot of problems with it. I think that discussion should take place and we should determine exactly what is meant by the, the concept of vouchers and choice. Uh, I've been trying to get a debate on that for a number of years. I've had a piece of legislation in. Uh, for now over two and a half years, and we haven't had any discussion. So the discussion is fine. The specifics of the proposal, again, would have to be looked at. And I think that obviously, if we do it in Jersey City, we should do it in a number of other cities. Jersey City should not be the only place. Uh, a pilot program concept is an interesting concept, but I'd have to see all of the totality of the presentation before I could say I agree with it. All right, Assembly Minority Leader Joe Doria, thank you for joining us. I'm Larry Stupnagel. Let's go back to the studio now and Steve Highsmith. Thank you, Larry. And joining us is uh, Roger Bauman, Jim McQueenie, and of course also joining us Howard Green of the New Jersey Historical Commission. Howard, you've taken a good look at the speech. You've listened to it. You're knowledgeable about past speeches. Do you find anything sounding familiar or hitting on same themes from any other famous ones? Well, I, the first thing I would say is I have not read all the governor's inaugural addresses. I, and why I not? To <laughs> I have to Tomorrow I'll do that. Okay. Um, this speech strikes me as um, a speech that tells us something about the kind of person w Mrs. Whitman is and the kind of governor she hopes to be. It was solid. It was straightforward. And I didn't personally hear any fireworks or magics or wonderful new metaphors or figures of speech, but I heard concrete proposals. Uh, along the lines of the theme she ran her campaign, campaign on. It's what she said she was going to do, and it's what she has done. And it reminds me a little bit of uh, Woodrow Wilson, who also gave a speech when he came into office that was exactly what he said it was. What it, what it, it wasn't what he campaigned on. In fact, he was a candidate of the bosses. But it was a very distinct, specific, here is what I want to do in the first few months I'm in office. Simple and direct. And simple and direct and straightforward. And that's what I saw But one here. that perhaps could come back to haunt because it is so direct. I, um, I, I don't have a crystal ball. Well, perhaps these gentlemen do. <laughs> over here. Using our rather mind right here, here it all over the last year. But um, I think one of the things that was kind of interesting, though, was her uh, putting in the speech, evidently at the last minute, accelerating the tax cut, uh, and whether Donnie DiFrancesco, the Senate president, was kidding or not when he came up and made the funny comment. Uh, While well, I had the date January 1st, where I didn't have the year because it came quicker than he thought. He's in a situation where he's got to pay, pick up the tab for this thing, basically, as the Senate president with the Assembly Speaker perhaps on a campaign trail, Chuck Itayan running against Frank Lautenberg. So uh, Donnie D looked like the kind of person that was uh, expecting to go on a Dutch treat for lunch and then was told the last minute he was going to the restaurant, you're paying for it, pal, and more than you thought. So is that uh, put in the speech at the last minute the kind of thing that might have to be something recognized by legislators, giving to what uh, Howard says here about style? Uh, she certainly was her own person on this thing, and even to the extreme of going now this is somewhat of a surprise uh, here, uh, but I would say one thing, legislators and the legislature doesn't take that kindly to a surprise. Roger, most Roger right. do you think that she has hit on this speech on some kind of theme that, that the public can latch on to? Uh, Bill uh, Clinton has been criticized for not being able to find that particular buzz phrase yet. Uh, four years ago, Jim Florio said he wants to be remembered as the person who brought new ideas to old ideals that sort of fell exactly. flat. It was hard to understand. Right. Is this something that's understandable? I, and clear? I, again, I, I, as I said earlier, I mean, it, it's reminiscent of Harry S. Truman in my mind, plain speaking. I agree with him with Howard here. The fact is, is that she said, and I mentioned this earlier, after all, we all work for you. And and uh, I think that there was uh, this, this 
you know, this this attempt, to, uh, not by design, obviously, in Trenton in the last number of years, to this sort of holier than now. We'll do it for you. We'll take care of you. Uh, you know, that's not in this speech. All right. I want to find out whether or not you think she's going to get back on the bus too, Roger. <laughs> uh, that was so successful during the Whitman campaign for governor. But we're going to take it now to Michael Aaron, who is standing by live at the uh, outside the War Memorial Building to continue our coverage of inauguration day. Michael. Ken, thanks very much. I'm with Senate President, former Senate President John Russo. He was the Democratic Senate President for part of the Kane years, and he's now a lobbyist on State Street. Is that the correct way of saying what you do now? Princeton Public Affairs on State Street, yes. John, what was your reaction to Christy Whitman's inaugural address? I thought it was a wonderful speech. Uh, it was great politically, and it was also great as a program for New Jersey, if she can carry it out. Uh, that remains to be seen, but I thought it was a fantastic inaugural speech, maybe the best I've heard. When you say it was great politically, what uh, what touch or what words or, or what? It... Well, she really hit on all the themes that the people of New Jersey are concerned about and care about, uh, crime particularly, certainly the fiscal thing, the tax uh, problems. These are the things people wanted to hear. They also wanted her to deliver. I hope she can. I think she can, uh, and it'll be interesting to see. Her, uh, her announcement that she wants to cut the income tax retroactive to January 1st took most people by surprise, correct? I think it took the Republican Senate leadership by surprise, uh, but I think now it's a, it's a goal for them. Hopefully they can do it. Are you surprised that something like that in a major speech doesn't leak out? Doesn't, ordinarily in New Jersey, doesn't that sort of thing leak to the press about three days ahead of time? You know, I'm surprised these past few weeks how many things that have come uh, been proposed that didn't, didn't leak out. Senate President Don DeFrancis Francesco's proposal on senatorial courtesy didn't leak out. This didn't leak out. It seems like things are tightening up around here. You said that you think the, the program that she's laying out for the state is good. What do you mean by that? The, the cutting of taxes, the stimulating of business? Well, no question about it. Stimulating business is good and stimulating jobs. Cutting taxes and, and saving the people money so they can use it for other things is good. Crime, her, her thoughts on crime, if they work. People are, are terribly concerned today about safety. So it's a good program if she can do it, and I hope she can. Well, what about the cutting side of the ledger? What about the spending cuts? Are you one who thinks she's going to have to make much more painful and obvious cuts than she seems to think she is going to have to make. Uh, Mike, I've always felt that there are cuts that could be made in this state government uh, that won't hurt as much as people seem to think they will. Uh, I think if she does that and doesn't hurt people who need help, she can cut that money, I, at least a, a good part of it. Okay, John Russo, thanks for sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you. This is Michael Aaron with former Senate President John Russo. Let's go back to the studio. All right, Michael, thank you. We've talked about promises and tax cuts and Howard Green uh, necessarily so that with a Republican governor and uh, holding the majority in both houses of the legislature necessarily smooth sailing for a governor? Well, it's, I don't want to predict the future here, but there are certainly precedents in the past for governors having legislatures in their own party uh, and having to, uh, coming forward with programs that were not popular with that legislature, creating splits and breaking up what seemed to be co um, solid coalitions. You know, Governor Byrne in 1973 had basically the same situation for him, a lopsided Democratic majority, and he used to joke about how out of control it could be, uh, that Trenton was in the hands of a three-party system, the Democrats, the Republicans, and the wacky majorities. But see, the point you have to keep in mind in, in Governor Cahill had a similar situation, but in, 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 the, in the case of Cahill and Byrne, they, it was the whole income tax fight that dominated the 1970s political agenda as a function of education, funding, and so forth. You know, the Republicans don't like to raise taxes. You have a philosophical uh, circumstance here where they're on the same side of the question. Republicans uh, like to uh, cut but, taxes. But each but house has yeah. its own agenda. You've right. got the both houses of the legislature with their agenda, and certainly the executive branch uh, with the governor I, has her see, agenda. I think you'll see, actually, Christy, will have less trouble with the public on this, less trouble with the Democrats on this, and more trouble with uh, her own uh, majorities. In the